Hello and welcome to the Kind of Fruity Podcast. I'm Misfits. And I'm Brenna, his wife. Hey, how's it going, everybody? So I know we've had a little bit of a break in between episodes. Um, it's been a little bit difficult trying to find time to record some of these lately, especially with the work schedules and uh, a few new things that have happened lately. So let's talk about how you, hun, have finally hit affiliate on Twitch. Oh, you're going there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I did uh, recently hit affiliate on Twitch. I don't know what else to say <laughs> about that. Like, uh, I mean, I didn't expect it, to be honest. Like, I figured, you know, I'd be, I wouldn't get affiliate until sometime next year, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. Um, that, I've got a lot of work ahead of me, because there's emotes to do. Yeah, there's already been a few that she's done on, um, a couple of her art streams that she's made for, like, emotes for not only her Twitch, but for the, uh, Discord group, which, uh, if you no. ever catch one of her live streams uh you can always get a link to that well those are strictly the, those ones that i've been doing are strictly for discord <laughs> use the ones that will be for um twitch are different I, I did start on a few of those so i guess i have started on a, a few yeah and if you're uh, watching us on the uh, youtube version uh you can see some of them right over here where my violently headbanging a little bit. Also, hi! You can probably see that this time is a little bit different. Yeah, a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, you can see that she's uh, a little bit more animated than me, but uh, yeah. if you get a chance, check her out on Twitch at Brenna MSM. She's almost three away from the funny number. Actually, I believe I'm two away from the funny number now. Ooh. Yep. And on that note, I got one other little thing that we can talk about real quick. So this podcast is not sponsored, but it technically kind of is when you think about it. So I'm going to take a moment to tell y'all about the Little Witch Shop. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Little Witch Shop is, well, exactly what it says on the tin. It's a shop up here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, that carries all manner of things for practicing or new witches, all the way from uh, herbs, candy candles, any sort of spell components that you might be interested in, different handmade bracelets, clothing, as well as books and basically all you need for a bunch of witchy goodness. Yeah. <laughs> we've uh, we've spent a lot of time down there and um, the uh, owners, uh, Waylon and Echo, they've just got the most magnificent energy. And uh, well, I'll let you tell the story, hon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've told this on my stream, but uh, one of the times we were visiting I don't get to go there as much as he does, but uh, usually he's getting stuff for me. Uh, <laughs> since I'll be honest, my aesthetic is definitely witchy stuff. I'm very much a Hallow baby. I love Halloween and anything to do with that. Yeah. And so, in fact, even for Christmas stuff, you know, I know that there's like a really old uh, tradition, which maybe i'll talk about later in this podcast since it is uh, the wintry time but uh basically one of the times that we've the last time we visited and i was with uh him and a friend of ours i was talking to the owners of the shop and i don't know why but i i ended up bringing up that you know my like i said my aesthetic is witchy on my twitch stream so i ended up bringing up that i streamed and the guy was like while I was talking to uh, Echo, the guy, Waylon, was like, now I want to see if there's something I can give you for your streams. And I was like, oh, that's a thought. That's a nice, thoughtful thing. But I didn't think anything of it. And so I'm still talking. We're all still just chatting away. Uh, and he comes back with this ear cuff is what it is. It's an ear cuff in the shape of a dragon with a little dangling gem and wing looking piece at the bottom of it. Uh, basically an ear cuff is something you put on the on your ear, around your ear. People have probably seen them at uh, conventions and even uh, if someone like dressed up as an elf or something like that for renaissance festivals then you most likely have seen an ear cuff at some point. 
Yeah. And I was like, oh, thank you. But, you know, I'm a VTuber. I don't really show my actual face. And they were like, oh, well, that's okay. It's yours. You now have a story to tell. <laughs> I was just like, they're not going to let me leave until I take this. So. <laughs> um, so I pretty much got a, a, a gift from the witch shop. I might try to model it. Don't quote me. I might try to model it and put it on my VTuber. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, if nothing we'll else, I'll definitely uh, pop a picture of that up in uh, the video. Uh, you can yeah. check them all out at uh, littlewitchshop.com. Uh, also, if you're in the Green Bay area, you can usually get free same-day delivery. Just, uh, you know, toss them a little something extra for the time and effort. And also, any um, supplies that you order from them, if your order comes to over $100, you can get that shipped free as well. So check them out sometime. Little Witch Shop in Green Bay. Yeah. <laughs> So on that note, I've got something a little bit fun. Uh, this one came out um, towards the end of last month. I haven't heard anything else specifically about it, but uh, this should uh, hit a little close to home for Brenna here, considering it involves Tennessee, and specifically mm -hmm. a famous brand of whiskey, Jack Daniels. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, Jack Daniels is suing a company for basically trademark infringement, uh, VIP products. This, uh, company created a, uh, dog toy that was sort of modeled in the shape of a Jack Daniels whiskey bottle. Uh, the company... Oh, okay. Yeah. The company is claiming that it counts as protected speech as basically parody. Uh, Jack Daniels claims that it's essentially infringing on their trademark because it causes damage to their brand. How? Exactly. I'm kind of confused by this. I'll toss a picture up in the, uh, up in this one about it. The, uh, Silly Squeakers Bad Spaniels rubber squeaky toy is shaped like a whiskey bottle with a cartoon spaniel on the front and the caption, Bad Spaniels, the old number two on your Tennessee carpet. Now, uh, on the back of the, uh, chew toy, there is a disclaimer saying that the product is not affiliated with Jack Daniels Distillery. Now, the big claim in this is that it could cause people to be confused that it might be produced by them, but considering there's a disclaimer on it, already and realistically I don't think anyone's going shopping for dog toys in the liquor aisle and if they do they've probably got other problems that they need to be concerned about and it's called what? It's called Bad Spaniels the old number two on your Tennessee carpet oh so it's not even supposed to be whiskey it's a big bottle of pee yeah it's just a dog toy <laughs> now granted it is designed after the shape of their bottle but also considering it has a disclaimer text on it that it is not affiliated with the Jack Daniels company, I would assume that that doesn't count. But then again, I'm not a lawyer. Well, I'm not a lawyer either, but that is basically parody. As long as you like everybody who's had to deal with like fair use on like YouTube or even um, streaming platforms and have had to deal with that, know what the difference between fair use and parody is to just straight up law breaking or um, perjury and, and, and theft of ideas and shit, which you can't really steal ideas, but yeah. basically copyright infringement is what I was trying to say. Copyright infringement and perjury, like people know the difference between fair use and parody, or at least most people do. Yeah. But people who want to make a quick extra buck, like big companies, I'm not going to name any, but we all know <laughs> who I'm talking about. Um, but big companies do tend to put a lot of uh, thought into loopholes of the parody law or rule or exception to the rules, basically. And will do anything they can to make a quick extra buck. However, if you know what you're doing and know what you're fighting for, you may come out on top. Just depends on, you know, what kind of court you go to, what judges you get, what lawyers you got. Everything hinges on people, and we all know how sucky that can be sometimes. But yes, the fact that it actually has not affiliated with, plus it is, while copying the shape of the bottle, um, there is a lot of booze bottles that I have seen that have very similar shapes, and Jack Daniels isn't going after them. Yeah. Plus, this is a dog chew toy, and it is definitely a parody. It's a humorous or comedic parody, um, given the name differences and what is uh, supposedly in the bottle. Uh, and like I said, it does, like, you 
like you told me it says um not affiliated with the jack daniels company therefore it is 100 percent parody and should fall under 100 percent free use uh parody laws and it should not be even borderline copyright infringement if all they're going on is like the shape of the bottle um they're not even one to one yeah like the uh the the square bit is a little bit low from the picture that i'm seeing the square bit is a little bit lower and th that makes the neck longer and less rounded ish uh between the base of the neck and the top of the square shoulders of the bottle like there is a clear difference in shape they're not one to one so if all they're going by like i said is the shape of the bottle then the only way they'd probably win that is just because they are a big company and a well-known company yeah at least that's my opinion <laughs> so a lot of the uh like media opinion would agree with that to an extent so i'm gonna actually quote here from a article by a wreg in memphis uh news channel 3 in their report on um november 20th uh here's a little excerpt the toy maker says jack daniels can't take a joke it's ironic that america's leading distiller of whiskey both lacks a sense of humor and does not recognize it when it's and everyone else has had enough lawyers for the arizona-based vip products were wrote in the high court. Uh, Jack Daniels lead attorney Lisa Blatt made no bones about the company's position in her writing. To be sure, everyone likes a good joke, but VIP's profit motive joke confuses consumers by taking advantage of Jack Daniels' hard-earned goodwill. She wrote for the Louisville, Kentucky-based Brown Foreman Corp., the Jack Daniels' parent company. Blatt also wrote that a lower court decision provides near-blanket protection to humorous trademark infringement and said it has broad and dangerous consequences pointing to children who were hospitalized after eating marijuana-infused products that mimicked candy packaging. So, it's fun that it always goes back to that. <laughs> Look, not every child was dumb enough to try to eat an actual packet of cigarettes after eating candy cigs, okay? Yeah, exactly. And they even got renamed to just being, like, candy sticks. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, they were still in a box that looked very much like a cigarette case. But not every kid was dumb enough to actually eat real cigarettes. Most of us knew the difference between powdered sugar and as a stick and something that's filled with what look, what what feels like um, dried grass. Yeah, there's an interesting thing about that, too. Um, a little while ago, um, another podcast I listened to, Behind the Bastards, did a coverage on like the history of all the shit that's come from the entirety of the tobacco industry and one of those fun things was the whole candy cigarettes thing which i knew from my dad at one point used to be literally just candy packages that were marked the same as regular cigarettes to essentially con kids into thinking oh hey i i remember these from when i was a kid and then buying cigarettes when they're older or whatever and the truth is a little bit more interesting than that the companies that created the candy cigarettes were not originally affiliated with the tobacco companies but they were trying to essentially steal profit off of them by making essentially a parody product of it and here's where things get interesting the tobacco companies at first, while they did try and do something to get rid of them, they came to the realization that, well, if these kids are buying these, like, Lucky Strikes or whatever as a candy, then they're just going to buy Luckies when they get old and can smoke. So it still benefits them regardless, because then they'll have that sort of brand association in their minds already. Yeah. One could make the argument that this is kind of like that, how you run across Sour Patch Kids and stuff like that in stores, and then you go to, like, a head shop somewhere, and they've got, like, CBD or uh, Delta THC-infused gummies that are designed off of the Sour Patch Kids. Here's the thing. Maybe adults want to have something that tastes good, too. <laughs> Just, it doesn't always have to be boring. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, like, it, most of those things started out as, like, a prank a prank parody thing for profit and then like you said basically the tobacco company was like hey this gets people hooked on cigarettes at an early age because these kids are eating candy candy that looks like cigs so when they're old enough to actually smoke they'll buy a pack of cigs being like hey i had the candy yeah. and so i don't see <laughs> i don't see the harm in having a chew toy like that because here's the thing and this is going to be rude and i know it's going to be rude but dumbass people who've always been dumbass people uh -huh. are going to be dumbass people and if they already feed their dog whiskey they're already they're going to keep feeding their dog whiskey regardless of the existence of this chew toy 
yeah, speaking on that, um, so this has actually been going on for a while. Um, the company had started its uh, whole line of silly squeakers and was even selling the Bad Spaniels toy in 2014. Uh, Jack Daniels told the company to stop, but the company went to court to be to make an appeal to still sell its product. It's been drawn well, out for so long that they've still been allowed to sell their product in the meantime. I don't think it's had any effect on the uh, sales of Jack Daniels. Probably not. Better yet, the uh, Silly Squeakers, it isn't just Jack Daniels. They mimic liquor, beer, wine, and soda. They include a couple of things like Mountain Drool, Ew. Uh, Heine Sniffin, which parodies Heineken. Uh, in 2008, however, they did get barred from uh, selling its Budweiser parody, Butt Wiper. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, these are all just comedic things. And going back to what I said, no, that doesn't mean I think it's okay to feed your dog or any pet alcohol. Like, no, I don't think that's okay. Yeah. I mean, if a veterinarian who has studied for years tells you that it's fine, I can't really argue with that because that's someone who's been in the profession of taking care of animals. But currently, as far as I know of, it's not good to do it for your animals. As far as I know of, it's not good to do it. So I don't agree with it. Yeah, it's probably not great. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't assume that it would be good for an animal, to be honest. Because it's barely good for people. Actually, it's not good for people, but, you know, people. True. Got a couple bottles of Jack Daniels in uh, the cupboard that <laughs> say, yeah, yeah, it's probably not that great. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like people are gonna do if that's if, if if that's even like an argument that gets brought up it's like people were doing that to their dogs before this chew toy was invented like i've heard stories of really old men who've had like their old hound bloodhound and even talk about stories uh, about like how their old bloodhound was so good that you know once they got really old and age and everything and were ready to retire from the old hunting business you know, they'd start every now and then giving them uh, a, a little bit of their uh, uh, their booze. They'd share their beer with them, put it in their little dog bowl and give it to them. And it's like, I know that's supposed to be a cute story, but I'm pretty sure that's what helped your dog, you know, get to an earlier grave than before. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd have just left it alone. Yeah. But um but like I said, yeah, I've heard stories from when I was growing up in Tennessee about like old men and, and, and people doing that with their pets and it's just like so if that if that ever becomes an argument, easy to shoot down because it's like, dude, they've been doing that with their animals before this chew toy existed. They probably were doing that before Jack Daniels existed and it was just beer. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I don't see how that's changing people because it's like I said Dumbass people are gonna be dumbass people because they're dumbass people, and that's what they do. Mm -hmm. I'm not calling anyone in general a dumbass, but I'm pretty sure everybody who's listening to this probably has at least one person that they can identify as a dumbass person. Sup? You don't feed booze to dogs. <laughs> True. Except for yourself. Yeah. You're the only dog that gets the booze. <laughs> <laughs> On that note of, uh, companies making stupid decisions. Let's go on to uh, another topic here. Oh boy. So uh, we're recording this on a Wednesday. The fun thing about Wednesday for us is uh, <laughs> I host a D&D &D game for us and uh, a couple of our friends. I'm the uh, DM. And uh, yeah, that's kind of relevant because uh, there was recently a shareholders meeting with uh, Wizards of the Coast where their uh, CEO expressed a desire for the type of recurrent spending you see in digital games, uh, going on to also describe the possibility of microtransactions and other things in their new uh, D and D Next platform that they're working on creating the supposed D and D Sixth Edition. Basically, a little while ago they'd acquired uh, D and D Beyond which was originally like an independent group that was basically digitizing a bunch of D&D content and creating like a platform for homebrew content and everything within the D&D universe that was linked with a lot of online D&D gaming platforms like um, Roll20 mm -hmm. was the biggest one and just having access to all that stuff on your computer so you can use it at all times was just kind of handy. The only downside was due to licensing. If you bought one of the physical books for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition you would also have to rebuy 
Spotify on D&D Beyond to have access to it there, as opposed to using your own stuff. So having everything all unified like that is kind of interesting. Like, I like the idea that if I were to buy a D&D book, that I would have a free digital copy with it that I could just register by, like, um, a uh, code that would be on, like, the back page or something, as opposed to having to rebuy these 40 to $60 books multiple times just to have access to them on multiple platforms. But one possible way they discussed was, like, having different chapters of content or whatever be individually priced out. And, yeah, that sucks. I'm trying to still figure out how they plan on doing some kind of online bullshit currency for d, &D. <laughs> I mean, it would probably end up being similar to how you would do with Steam, where you buy a single game and then you can buy all the individual DLCs. Whereas, I... in this case, it would just have you have access to D&D, &D, but you need to buy each individual nickel and dime -y thing. Don't really see, but I'm just gonna nod and pretend I do. <laughs> so for uh, anybody who somehow in this modern age where Critical Role exists and uh, the uh, animated series on Amazon and the upcoming new Dungeons & Dragons movie, Honor Among Thieves, <laughs> doesn't know about D&D. Uh, it was originally created back in the 70s by a guy named Gary Gygax. <laughs> Wonderful name, by the way. It sounds kind of <laughs> like some sort of fantasy dude anyway. And um, fun thing, uh, dude was from Wisconsin. How is that a fun thing? Wisconsin has kind of a habit of introducing fun people to the world. Uh, we're responsible for Gary Gygax, uh, Ed Gein, the serial killer, and um, one of the... Uh, well, a couple of the worst politicians in all time. Um, Senator McCarthy from back in the uh, days of the Red Scare and currently uh, Senator Ron Johnson. I won't go into too much about him, but hey, he he's pretty bad. <laughs> but yeah, interesting people come from Wisconsin. Uh, I wasn't born and raised here, so I'm <laughs> sorry. This means nothing to me. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> so like, originally when the game was created, there was a lot of differences to the game how it is now. Um, it used to be played with just regular six-sided dice, so arguably it was a lot more simple back then, but as the game kind of grew in popularity, there were like different rules and stuff that needed to get changed for like the sake of making the game a little bit more easier to play, a little more accessible, adding new content to it and whatnot, so out came a second edition, or AD&D, Dungeons and Dragons Advanced. Uh, there was also the most popular edition, third edition, which came out in the early 2000s, which eventually influenced the uh, Pathfinder RPG. Then, of course, there's the uh, less popular 4th edition in 2008, and the current one, which is Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, which is the one that uh, me and my group currently plays, simply because I have all the books for it. <laughs> yeah, he's always buying a new book. Yeah, every once in a while. There's a few of them that I want to get at some point, but they're like, they must be either really popular in the communities or something, because they're always like so much higher priced than all the other books. 5th uh, edition is the current one. The uh, one that I mentioned earlier, D&D Next, that is supposed to essentially be like Dungeons & Dragons 6th edition, perhaps? Uh, basically, they release a new edition of it every 8 to 10 years or so, because updating some things here and there are better mechanics. The reality of it is, if you've created a game system and everybody's got a book for it, how are you going to keep making money other than, one, releasing new content, or two, revising the game system and making new versions of a lot of that old content so they can only be played with the new books. And that's basically been a lot of people's gripes with 5th edition as well. A lot of the system is a lot more accessible. There's a lot of it that's almost too simplified and some of it that's mostly in the content. A lot of the official releases that have come out have just been recycled stuff from like 3rd and 2nd uh, edition mostly. Like currently our group is playing the um, Sunless Citadel, the uh, revised edition for uh, Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition through uh, Tales from the Yawning Portal, uh. which uh, we're actually coming up pretty close to the end of that in our group, so that's going to be fun. I guess that pleads the question to what are we going to do after that? That one I'm not too sure, because I've been sprinkling in little extra bits here and there, because the adventure itself in the book is only like maybe 15 to 20 pages, so I've had to add in a lot of extra stuff, and... 
there's a few things in there that didn't make sense. So I've tweaked a few things around there and basically seeded out a few other bits for potential future games. But I'm waiting to see how, uh, what comes of all those things. It's like, uh, one of the artifacts that everybody found at some point. I do have plans for it but it all depends on if it's used or not. Which, when it comes to Dungeons & Dragons, that's the best thing about it, or most role-playing games in general. Uh, a lot of the adventures, while they do offer, like, a um, pre-set-out path, there's room for you to improvise, and the improvisation is highly encouraged because it helps make every experience kind of unique. Like, you're all running the same core storyline, but in the case of this module, uh, anything the DM can add in to spice it up a little bit, because it is a bit of a long dungeon crawl and that's about it. Anything you can do with it beyond that just sort of improves things significantly. The way I've always looked at things and especially now that I've started DMing as opposed to being like a co-DM for fourth edition was like my view on things is I'll allow it if it's fun because there's a lot of things that you can just do to increase like encourage creativity. I remember you saying that basically as long not just that it's fun as long as you can logic it uh -huh. then usually it's like it's almost anything goes but it's like if you can make it make sense to me as well as it be funny then most likely likely you'll get a yes this can happen yeah or not even funny just interesting like um there's the somewhat discussion that was going on one of the uh, twitter groups where it was about the spell uh heat metal which is uh commonly used by druids and is also available to like wizards because they can learn basically any kind of magic which it does exactly what it says on the tin if there's like some kind of metal near you that you can see you can heat the um thing about if you can see it is the big caveat that also involves another spell which i'll get into in a second like the idea behind this is somebody's coming at you with a sword so you use magic to make that sword instantly burning hot so maybe they drop it or it sets them on fire if they're covered in like some flammable liquid or if there's a wooden door that's held together by like metal braces you could potentially set the door on fire or like weld the lock shut which that actually came up in our last session whereas um the discussion was basically about can you use it on bones because calcium is actually a metal am i supposed to be surprised by this fact <laughs> not really um the obvious thing about that is, no, it wouldn't work because you can't see bones. They're inside of you. But yeah, you could think, but, well, you could see fangs or teeth or horns or stuff like that. Most horns aren't bone. Uh, teeth would be an exception, sure, because you can usually see those. But calcium in bones doesn't really take its metallic form, so it's not really metal. The other option is, um... The spell create water which basically creates an amount of water which can either fall like rain or all at once on a specific area and its power increases depending on like the strength of uh, magic you put into it so if you cast it as like a stronger version of the spell or if you're a higher level you can make more water so the same limitation applies where you can create it where you can see it so the idea came up at one point that you could use it on a creature basically fill their lungs with water and they would drown which in older versions where that wasn't specified yeah that was probably possible but not necessarily in this case when i speak of like a creative solution like if you can create multiple gallons of water out of nowhere and like drop that on something or someone that's going to be pretty heavy you might knock them out or potentially wash someone over the side of a cliff or something i was just thinking if someone made a character that was basically wolverine with an adamantine like or metal metal alloy skeleton you could possibly kill that person in a DD &D game with using that heat metal mm -hmm. that would be a specific case like um considering their bones are basically replaced with metal and they're extending their claws which are part of their skeleton so you would be able to use create metal on well you could use heat metal on that, which would Treat essentially, metal. yeah, that'd be a spell. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just create metal where on your bones. <laughs> Why? So I can heat it. It's a very convoluted plan just to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> just use a sword or magic missile or something. Yeah. Which also, speaking of D&D, um, there's the Baldur's Gate 3 game that I've been talking about a lot over the last couple years with uh, Brenna here. Oh. 
So speaking of Dungeons and Dragons, there's also the new Baldur's Gate 3 game that's uh, coming out soon. Uh, first thing on that, they finally have a tentative release date. It's supposed to be fully coming out next year, which is kind of great. I've been uh, part of the early access for about two years now since um, like their second patch, where basically every patch they'll add in like a new character class or some new thing, but you're only getting to play like act one of the game. So you're basically doing that over and over again. Which, like, that gets a little tedious, so eventually I just sort of haven't been playing it as much. But it's been kind of cool seeing it develop from um, the janky mess it was when it first got released as, like, a public alpha. All the way to now, where it's a little more feature complete, but there's still, like, a few things here and there with it that need to get worked on. But... I'm still pretty excited for it, and it's one of those games that I would love to get for uh, her and I to play together, especially when it comes out for real. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, um, it's also, well, again, by Larian Studios. Uh, they're the company that made uh, Divinity 2, which we played for a short time before, uh, well, we'll just leave it at stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> stuff. But... That is one I'd like to get back to at some point and try that over again, even if it's just you and me. We'll see. <laughs> but uh, right now, uh, Baldur's Gate is actually having their panel from hell, which is where they do uh, all their announcements on what's coming new to the game. So there's probably like a new patch that's coming out soon, adding some more content. It's suspected to be the Paladin class, which will be kind of neat to see how that's put in. And, well, there's actually been some stuff that's been shown in one of the trailers. Apparently, kobolds are finally coming to the game. Oh! Now, whether or not they're playable is a different question, if they just even appear as NPCs or enemies. I'll be satisfied that kobolds are there, but I'll be disappointed. Because I want to I be a kobold. Kobolds. They're nice. <laughs> just little dragon boys. They're good. <laughs> friend of ours would be very happy to hear that you're trying to go kobold. <laughs> yeah. Well, sort of changing topic. Uh, topic. Topic. <laughs> sort of moving to a different topic, but one that was mentioned at the beginning was uh, this is the time of the winter. This is the cold. This is the snow. It is close to Christmas or getting closer to Christmas every day. And also closer to New Year every day as well. But there is a, uh, because I like spooky things, because I like Halloween and stuff like that, doesn't mean I don't like Christmas or I dislike Christmas. Um, in fact, there is a really old Christmas tradition that some people still do to this day, some people don't. But it's one that, you know, is a type of tradition that I wouldn't mind seeing again. I wouldn't mind participating in, which is the telling of ghost stories. Yeah, believe it or not way back when, apparently ghost storytelling around a campfire wasn't just something you did at a uh, band camp. It wasn't something you just did at regular camp. It wasn't something you did uh, on a sleepover or Halloween get-together. No, it was also a Christmas tradition to sit around and tell ghost stories around nice. Christmas time. Why they did it? I'm not sure, other than the fact that winter is essentially the end of a uh, close to the end of a year it is cold it is the time of year where crops and uh plants uh and uh, uh, uh hibernate just like animals or in some cases some people will consider it them dying and therefore winter is connected with death a lot uh, or the ending of a cycle basically but New Year's, which is also in winter, is the beginning of a new cycle. And so I guess it makes sense in that aspect of understanding what winter is or what winter symbolizes to some peoples. It probably does make sense that ghost stories would be a part of Christmas. Because while Christmas is a very lively time of year, it's also during winter, which is also the very end of a cycle of 
well, life and growth. At least that's how I see it. I mean, that kind of tracks, too, when you think about it. Um, Bringing things back to um, witchy stuff for a moment. Like uh, with Yule coming up also a little bit before Christmas. Um, If I remember correctly, for like the uh, cycle of the year, that's supposed to be when um, the crone is the uh, dominant one. And basically, life is essentially leaving the world and preparing again to be reborn come uh, springtime. Yeah. My witchy lore isn't the best. I'm still learning. Uh, well, if you're an anime fan, the Magus' bride actually, I believe, goes in on to some of that, actually. Um, and it was, if I remember correctly, it was depicted as, you know, when winter solstice comes, the crone um, is preparing for her rebirth because previously she was the mother and after she is no longer the mother and has become the crone she prepares to disappear but she doesn't really disappear because the way they kind of explain it or depict it is she kind of is reborn as herself which is kind of a convoluted way of saying she is her own mother (laughs) and grandma it's a weird cycle but uh, at least that's how it depicts certain things but yes winter is supposed to be the time of the crone um and throughout her lifespan i believe she is supposed to be married to uh i want to say in some legends i think in certain areas i think it's like uh carnunus or the forest god or something like that yeah uh there's so many different names for the same creature same being but like throughout her whole life, she's supposed to be married to this this being. Uh, don't quote me. <laughs> yeah, don't quote me. Uh, I'm still learning too. But like, I like I said, I do remember that the Magus's Bride anime does like not really tiptoe, but like touches up on that bit of myth, that bit of lore, depending on how you see it. Yeah. That's the one thing, too, like, uh, every religion out there has, like, its sort of interesting parts of its lore, like the, uh, strange contradictions here and there, so it's, like, at a point, you just sort of roll with it, because maybe it's got a good lesson to teach, if nothing else. Because, like, yeah. I can definitely say for both of us growing up Christian that, uh, there's some, there's some bits that are a little weirder yeah. than others. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But at, like, the core of it, some of the simple things that the Bible had always tried to present was, like, uh, essentially just living a good life. You know, don't steal, don't kill a motherfucker, don't be cruel or anything like that. Just in general, don't be a dick. (laughs) Now, mind you, there's plenty of people out there that really need to take that one to heart. Especially for uh, some of those big mega churches and stuff. And a lot of people who claim to be doing stuff in the Lord's name where it all just sort of turns out they're just trying to spread hatred and division between each other. Whether it be just because you come from a different sect of the same thing or maybe you were born gay or you're transgender or anything like that. But just because you don't fit somebody else's idea of what they think the norm should be doesn't mean that you're any less valid as a person. Yeah. And on that note, I think this is probably a good time to end it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, I froze again. Hold on. Yeah, the iPhone does not like Bup. (laughs) Oh, shit. (laughs) I told you it doesn't like Bup. I am definitely keeping that in. Why? Because you were kind of turned towards me for a second... But then your image just sort of shuddered for a second and then snapped to, to like, straight on view. Yeah, that's because it froze and crashed. (laughs) But, um, shall we end? Yeah. So, for the Kind of Fruity podcast, I'm Misfit. And I'm Brenna. And, uh, thank y'all again for listening. Uh, if you celebrate it when it's coming up, blessed Yule to you. And also Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays in general. 
I'm going to be a butt and say Merry Christmas and Blessed Be. Blessed Be. And if you're listening to this before bed, then have a good night. Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bite. Have a good one.